But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. You know, every Christmas we take time, we go to the Bible, and we tell the Christmas story. Well, this year what we're going to do for Easter is I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 25, and I'm going to tell you not the Christmas story, but the Easter story. Now, I know the lights are off, and that's by design. Last song that we sing, we're going to turn the lights on. I'm going to ask you to stand and sing with us. But right now, if you remember this morning, I'd ask you to sit there, and I want you to meditate on what happened 2,000 years ago. Because that is some of the most awesome praise that you can give to God is for you to stop in our busy day, in our busy schedules, in our busy times. And, and the truth is, these times become our busiest and sometimes we miss the point, which is Jesus and what he's done. So I, I want you, you may have your Bible, that's great, we'll provide the scriptures for you. I want you just to sit there this morning and listen as I tell you the Easter story this morning. Matthew 27, verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom he wanted. They had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, had nothing to do with that righteous man. For I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of you two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. And then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. And they gathered the whole battalion before him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, put a ring in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hell, king of the Jews. They spit on him. They took the reed and struck him on the head. When they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. So they went out and they found a, a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting the lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put this charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lamba sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Hallelujah. The earth shook, 
rocks were split. The tombs were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had died were raised. Coming up out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion, those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. You know, the cross it is the compass by which we are directed. But what does the cross represent? I mean, in our day, we wear it. We paint it on signs. We put it up in our church. But what about in Paul's day? What about in Jesus' day? The cross in their day, it meant only one thing. Death. It wasn't until after the second century, until after every person that had ever witnessed a crucifix, crucifixion had died, that they began to use the cross similar to what we use it today. But you know, the truth is we've gone in an opposite direction. The cross has become somewhat of a rabbit's foot, somewhat of a, a lucky charm, more superstition than anything else. Far from its intention. Far from what happened on Calvary's hill. Christ's record, resurrection conquered death. Amen. It gave us victory. It assured our salvation. Had it not been for that old rugged cross, that is what revealed God's grace. Yes. I want you to paint this picture in your mind this morning as we go through it for a second. There's that crucifixion. There it is taking place. What does that mean? Number one, it means that he hung in our place. How are we to imagine things in Jesus' day? Good way to imagine what Jesus' times were like and the, the place in which he lived is what's going on in the Middle East. Think about Iraq, Afghanistan, and Israel today. I mean, there's fighting in the streets everywhere. Death everywhere you look if you've been to that part of the globe. It's the same way it was in Jesus' day. Daily, the Hebrews would battle with the Romans. Then we come to this time of Passover. Their Passover was kind of like our Easter and our Christmas all rolled into one. So there was this huge celebration going on. And what would happen is the governor at that time to try to put down some of this fighting that was going on, he would release a criminal to try to appease the factions that were there. This is what the Bible says. And now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had this notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And so when they gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas? For this Jesus they called you, they called Christ. You know what Pilate was doing? He was trying to position Jesus. Pilate was trying to set him free. I want you to think about that for a second. You know what his offer was? Pilate offered them Jesus. They had, they had to choose. It would be kind of like us choosing Osama bin Laden or Jesus. They chose the criminal, the murderer, the thief. How obvious was this injustice? This one the Bible says. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him and said, Have nothing to do with this righteous man, for I suffered much from him in a dream. Here's the plot. Here's what was going on. Friends, listen to me. I don't know where you are today. Some of you have come here because you love the Lord and you have a relationship with you. Some of you have come here because it's tradition. It's what you do on Easter. Some of you are blatant atheists. We're going to hear it. Some of you are on the fence. And you're wondering. But here's the plot. You need to understand that no religion, no man-made religion, no denomination, none of that is going to help you at all. And if you're sitting there going, oh, I just don't get this Christianity thing. It's because all you ever looked at is religion. You've not looked Jesus in the face. Amen. Today you can. Amen. Let me show you the ugly of religion. Here's the plot. 
Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. So out of the, the, the two thieves there, these revolutionaries, they were terrorists. Literally, Jesus took Barabbas' place. That's why we gather him celebrating. Yeah. He took your place too. You know, if you're sitting there today saying there's nothing that Jesus can do for me, Pastor. Barabbas was a murderer and a rapist. He was the worst of the worst. You don't understand the gospel until you understand substitution. Jesus died for Barabbas and every other member of the human race. For the wages of sin is death. But all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the gift of God. What is the gift? Well, the gift of salvation. What is the gift? The gift is substitution. Let me ask you a question. What does a sub do? A sub stands in for someone else, don't it? That's what Christ did on the cross. He stood in for you. He stood in for me. He subbed for us. Taking God's wrath for you and for me. Second Corinthians says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God. Can you grasp that? That we might become the righteousness of God. But Christ became our wickedness for God's wrath. Mm -hmm. See, that's what Romans 5, 8 means when it says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Look up here for a second. You might say, but preacher, I've tried that Christian stuff. I just can't. I can't do it. When I clean my life up. It don't work this way, boys and girls. He died for you when and while you were the dirt bag you are Amen. right now. Amen. Yes. And he'll change you yeah. into something precious. <laughs> Number two, he's accused in our place. The cross is universal. It doesn't matter where in the globe you go. It doesn't matter what cultural. It doesn't matter your background, your nationality, your origin. The cross is universal. And the cross makes an outrageous claim. And the cross is incredibly offensive. Listen to Pilate's reaction. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a light was beginning, he took water, washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See it yourselves. Do you know what the Jews, what their response was? Look, look, look. The cross, the response, it's like this all over the world. You may have had this response. I did. Listen to the Jews' response. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Crucifixion was the absolute worst way that a human could die. I want us for a second to review the payment that Jesus made for us. This is what the Bible says. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters. They gathered a whole battalion before him. They stripped him naked and put a scarlet robe on him, <coughs> twisting together a crown of thorns. Hey, by the way, I know that that big church burnt down over there, over across the pond. Somebody asked me, what you think about all that stuff burning down. I don't give a rip about relics. A relic never changed anybody's life. Right. Jesus came out of the grave 2,000 years ago. He's in heaven. That's what matters. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. Kneeling before them, they mocked him, saying, Hell, King of the Jews, they spit on him. Y'all need to listen. This is what he did for you. They spit on him. 
They took a reed and struck him in the head. And when they mocked him, they stripped him of the rope and put his own clothes on him and led him away. And as they went out, they found a man, a Cyrene Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross because Jesus had been beaten so severely he could not. When they came to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, and they sat down and kept watch over him. And over his head they put a charge against him which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two thieves that you and I. These two guys, they cover all of humanity. Because one thief will reject Jesus, and one will accept him. You're here this morning. There is no middle ground with Jesus. You're going to wholeheartedly accept him this morning or reject him when you walk out of here. There's no middle ground. Right today, you're on trial. Just like the two thieves. And they were wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked them, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were there crucified with him, they reviled him in the same way. First the Romans cursed at Jesus and reviled him. Then the Jewish leaders. And then even the criminals who were hung in the same fashion, in the same shape as him. Then they begin to curse him. This is known as Christ scandalizing. The scandalization of Christ. What, what does that mean, preacher? I, I could explain it, give this big definition, but you know exactly what it means. Won't you take one of your non-believing, non-Christian friends out to have coffee with you and just broach the subject of Jesus? What happens? They get offended, don't they? Then they get offensive. It's amazing. I've witnessed it before. I was in an airport, and there was a preacher that I knew about over here, and he just began over here to talk. He was a distance away from me. Didn't even realize I was around. He began to talk to someone about Jesus, and they all of a sudden, that conversation they had that had been going great for 20 minutes just went boom. In our day and age, we can talk about Muslims, Islam. We can be pro-homosexual. Everything but a blood-bought, passionate, born-again Christian. <coughs> At best, your non-Christian friends will kind of sh sh give you a... But if you are sold out for Christ, you'll be scandalized also. Yes. If you don't believe me, then why can we pray in any other name except Jesus' name today? Why, when you look on television and talk shows, they'll interview anybody and everyone except when it comes to a Christian. Listen, that's the way it's supposed to be. The cross is offensive. This is known as the scandalization of Jesus. And you and I as believers, we're going to experience it also. But do you know why it's like that? Listen very closely. The reason it's like that is because on that cross, there was a battle going on. Between Satan and Jesus for your soul. That's right. That's right. And today, there's a battle going on for your soul. See, on that cross, Jesus was fighting for the souls of men. Can you hear them? Even 2,000 years ago, can you hear them curse and mock and chant at Listen closely. You still here today. Thirdly, he suffered in our place. This is what the Bible says. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. He suffered in our place. Isaiah says it this way. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. His appearance was so marred that he didn't even resemble a man. Many of you have watched Mel Gibson's rendition of the crucifixion, 
What the Bible tells us is that the truth, that the real crucifixion, what he really suffered was so far worse than anything Mel Gibson could put on screen that it made Mel Gibson's rendition look mild. The word excruciating is literally taken from out of the cross. Crucifixion. He was beaten, the skin stripped off to his organs exposed. And then he was nailed to the tree where he would have suffocated and his own heart and fluid and his lungs filled up and then suffocated and he not given up the ghost. Why is so heartless? Why is crucifixion so terrible? Because it was for terrorists. That's what it was designed for. Governments used it to make an example of those who tried to overthrow their power. You know, the truth is we really can't comprehend what Jesus has suffered for us. He suffered, listen, listen. He suffered for our sins. You know what I've noticed? We think too highly of ourselves. We, if you haven't got to a point in your life where you realize without Christ, there's nothing valuable to you, you think too highly of yourself. He suffered because of our sins. The worst suffering, though, that he suffered, it was separation from God. That's what the Bible says. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land to the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders that said, hearing him, said, this man's calling for Elijah. And one of them ran at once, took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to drink. But others said, wait, let's see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Now, the only physical complaint we have recorded in Scripture of Jesus saying anything about his suffering is in John 19, 28, when he says, I thirst. Because Hebrews tells us that he suffered, he looked to the cross, knowing, listen, last week, 2,000 years ago, he knew that suffering was coming. He knew that that separation was coming. But Hebrews says, Look to your face and say it'll be one. Yeah. The Bible says from the ninth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour, sixth hour to the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice. And he gave up the ghost. He said, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabatani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, the darkness was a symbol of God separating himself, God the Father, from God the Son. Listen. From before creation, from time beyond, there had never been a time when God the Father and God the Son had been separated. And what that means is Jesus literally chose to go through hell for you. Because that's what separation from God is. Listen, there's a real place called hell with fire and brimstone and worms that never die. The worst part about hell would be an eternity. Separated from all that is good. That's right. God. Yeah. What's interesting is you study the Gospels and you read through the Gospels. And if you do that, you know that you just fly right through the Gospels on every story. Except when you come to the crucifixion. There's three chapters dedicated to it. It's like it slows down. It's slow motion. Fourth and finally, he paid in full sin's debt. I love this one. Listen to verse 51. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook and the rock split. You see, if that hadn't happened, none of this rest of this would have mattered. Let me tell you how important that little scene was. What that mean was, unless God was satisfied with the sacrifice, no one had hope. That's right. When that temple, when that curtain tore from top to bottom, that was God answered from heaven, I accept his sacrifice. You see, in the temple, 
in the Holy of Holies, God's presence would be back in the Holy of Holies, and he was separating a, a curtain this wide, the, the width of a man's hand, separated God's presence from any living human. Why? Because we are sinful. God's holy, and he cannot tolerate us. And so there had to be a way for man to be saved, to be made righteous, and you and I can't do it. That's why it tore from top to bottom. Listen, no amount of legalism, no amount of a certain church or denomination or good deeds or giving money, none of that matters. Until you give your heart to Jesus and you're adopted into the family of God. You see, from top to bottom, as God came from heaven to earth to save us, you can't save yourself. The only sacrifice he will accept is, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. and he, that tour, that was God saying, I accept. Mm -hmm. Top to bottom, God said, I accept this sacrifice. But here's the kicker. What had happened was Jesus made a way. God said, wrath is averted. Jesus made a way for us to approach God. But listen very closely to me. It is only through Jesus Christ. The only way that man can approach God is through Jesus. No other religion, no other belief. Only through Jesus Christ. And all because of the cross. <coughs> Sin's debt was paid. God is satisfied. God wants everyone to know about it. Listen to what God did. I love this. The tombs were open and many bodies of the saints that had fallen asleep were raised and were coming up out of the tombs after his resurrection. They went into the holy city and appeared to many. You know what's going on there? The natural order of nature was reversed. Amen. Instead of birth first and then death, those that had died, God resurrected and sent them into the city. By the way, if you believe the Revolutionary War happened, We've got more proof in history books that those dead raised from the dead and walked around in Israel at that time. We have more literature, more proof than yeah. we do that the Revolutionary Army took or war took place. Yeah. God reversed the natural order. Listen to what he says in verse 54. And when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was. The Son of God. People say, now listen, how could a good God allow evil to happen? Pastor, how, how could a good God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why doesn't God do something about it? Why doesn't God do something about wickedness and sin? He did it. Amen. The cross. Yep. See, the cross is where God offered us grace. Galatians 6, 14, But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. Yep. You can't earn it. It's a gift. How could any of us really think that we could even come close to the cross. Close to subbing for sin. Close to suffering for sin. Close to being scandalized for sin. Close to satisfying God for our sin. We can. It's only by the cross. It's only by God's grace. And that's the only glory in the cross. See, the glory of the cross is that God removes the penalty of our sin when we surrender our hearts to Jesus. Colossians 1, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, and then we have redemption for the forgiveness of sin. You know, over the years I've seen a lot of attempts at removing the penalty of sin. Pastor, what is the penalty of sin? Death. We see signs of it everywhere. I've seen people who, who hoard up huge 
fortunes. I've seen people who build huge estates. I've seen people who build these huge legacies and, and, and think in some way that is going to appease God. But I've never seen anyone escape death except one. <laughs> this is what the Bible says. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to, the, to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen. And as he said, Come see the place where I he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. The tomb is empty today. Amen. We have victory. Amen. Amen.